right, so today I am honored to be sitting in a room, well, far apart from everybody, but with uh, the absolute, some absolute monster musicians, some of my favorite drummers of all time, um, and guys that are masters of what we're going to talk about today, which is playing with brushes. Um, we did a short little thing, Steve and Adam and I, a couple weeks ago, and it got a really big response. So we figured we'd jump in a little further. Uh, we invited Jeff Hamilton. Uh, hi, Jeff. Thanks for joining. Hi, hi fellas. Absolute favorite. Great, Great to see you. Great to see you, Jeff. Thanks, Adam. Me too. Yes. So, Steve, why don't you start us off with a question? Yes. Um, well, it's a question slash comment. And, and I, I came up with this uh, recently because I did a, um, a brushes uh, Zoom chat for Vic Firth. And, and the moderator asked us like how we got started, how we like first studied playing with the brushes. And I, and I realized for me, and probably for most of us, uh, I never took any kind of brush lessons at first. It was just something that a drummer needed to do to play the gig. And, and I'd be on a gig, and for the most part, I'd be on an acoustic gig. I, I didn't start out my uh, gigging life only playing rock and roll. It was like part of it. But other, other gigs, I'd be playing a wedding with a clarinet player and an accordion player. And so I had to play brushes. So... I just got a pair of brushes and started playing. And there was no lessons involved. It was just trying to figure out what to do. And I just want to offer that as an idea. Like you don't need to go and, and take all kinds of lessons just to get started. Just get a pair of brushes, use your ear and, and get started. And that's the way I started. And then from there, I started to take some lessons and, and, and watch people play and get into some details. And in fact, one of the people that I really took some lessons from was Jeff Hamilton. Uh, when we were in Arizona at the Creative Drum Shop back in uh, probably 1979 or 1980. And, and at that point, then I started to refine my playing. But before that, it was just a matter of jumping in and, and getting started. So Jeff, do you want to jump in and uh, comment on that? Yeah, I, I'm surprised at how bad your memory is. You uh, you were teaching me what to do that night. We stayed up till four o'clock in the morning, and uh, all we did was ask each other what we do. So I exactly. I appreciate you uh, 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 thinking that I was teaching you lessons, but we were we were definitely changing uh, exchanging ideas as we exchanged drum sets earlier in the day, which uh, caught the audience by surprise. You know the the big uh, sunburst drum set, you know, what's, what's Hamilton going to do with that? Absolutely nothing. That's what I did. But, but we got together and, um, and, and like you, I think my beginnings with brushes were that um, uh, they threw in a pair of, of red ribbed uh, rubber Jean Krupa brushes, uh, Slingland brushes. That's it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah the premier, the Those premier. are premier. Yeah. 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 yeah the these had the loop on the end and, um, and so my mother said, look, that's a gift. And they threw those in. So don't, when it's a gift, so make sure you utilize that. Don't throw it in the bottom of your closet, you know. And so I felt guilty. It's like, okay, I got to do something with these brushes. And we had enough big band records in the house. And I would just play. I only had a snare drum at that time. Uh, that's all they would let me have until I won a contest with the rudimental drumming. Then at, at 12, I got a drum set. But at eight years old, I'm just kind of messing around with the brushes and playing to Louis Armstrong and some Basie records and trying to figure out for myself what it is. And I asked my snare drum teacher who played for uh, dances, like teenage cotillion dances. And he said, oh, you just kind of move them around like this. And here's a Philly Joe Jones brush book. Let me show you how this goes. And it wasn't the right information. That's not how it went. So when I did take the lesson with Philly Joe Jones later in the mid 70s, then I learned the proper way to execute that book. That's it. That's a book, artistry, brush, brush artistry. But, uh, you know, I agree with you. Just uh, and, and same thing with, with drums in general. Pick up the sticks and just play the records and, and try to see what they're doing and, and emulate what the drummers are doing. And you're, it, that'll get you out of the gate, at least. And, and it's the love of doing it is, is, is what the, what's going to come across the most. 
You know, what's really interesting, Jeff, I, I never really thought about it, but he, you're saying you were eight years old, all you had was a snare drum, and I think you can make a whole lot more music with a pair of brushes in a snare drum than a pair of sticks in a snare drum. Well, my neighborhood and my parents definitely thought so. <laughs> you, know I mean? you can keep time, you know, you can, you can get yeah. a backbeat going and, 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 and a ride cymbal pattern happening right on, on a snare drum with the, with the yeah where it doesn't sound so cool with the sticks, really. Well, and then late at night, I would play an album cover. They had that fantastic paper on the al on the LPs, and you flip it over, and it just had such a great sound and surface, but they couldn't hear me downstairs in their bedroom, so I could play brushes uh, after they, they thought I went to bed. You know? Three. like what the other gentleman said you know I would listen to records and then I would just try to emulate what I heard and watching different drummers as a young man I would watch and I'd be very curious and pretty much you know monkey see monkey do and then you'd hear a sound you'd try to do something with it and uh, you know it was one of those situations where you know I would take a record and like Jeff said, I used to practice on record covers. And um, it was a chance to practice and do things when everybody was sleeping or if you couldn't make any noise. And it, it gave me a chance to explore some possibilities. have to admit playing brushes definitely also helped my stick playing because it made me aware of that space between the beats that's something you play with the brushes and being aware of that helped my beat and helped my groove so I'm very much uh, a grateful person of the brushes because you see I don't use a comb but I am using brushes <laughs> you know I remember um you know, hearing, you know, Louis Belson play brushes, it, it was, you know, it was the early 80s. And, you know, I, I got to, you know, he was at Drummer's Collective a couple of times. We did an instructional video in a studio. So, you know, I was really close watching him and his motions to me, he like skated, you know, Louis just was like, it, it always looked like he was on ice and everything that he did was like, you, you know, kind of how it's slippery to walk on ice. His brushes, it looked like they were barely hitting the head. And you know, it was a beautiful, a beautiful thing just to watch it, never mind the sound that came out of him. Just his whole motion changed and his whole posture on the kit changed when he was playing brushes. I mean, Jeff, who would you say in terms of either influences or a couple of records? I'd love to hear your guys' opinion about some records that we could point people into to check out for brushes. Okay, uh, b before I go to that, I think the similarity between Mr. Belson and some of the other players of that period who played brushes were tap dancers. And if you watch a great tap dancer, they look like they're not putting any weight on the floor at all. And I think that influenced their brush playing a great deal. So I think that's one of the reasons it looked like they were, they were skimming the water like a stone, just you know, or skating, as you said. As far as influences for me, uh, I tried to play everything with brushes that I played with sticks and growing up in rudimental drumming, of course, Mr. Belson and, and uh, Buddy Rich and uh, Roy Burns, I saw at a very uh, young age and, and a clinic and he scared me to death with the way he played the snare drum. So I tried to, to, to transfer that over to the brushes. So those were early brush players. And then uh, about 10 years old, I discovered the Oscar Peterson trio with Ed Thigpen and Ray Brown. And I played to those records and I would stare at the album cover and Ray Brown had a, a, a little finger out like when he would go around the string and I would stare at that picture of him uh, playing the string and imagine that I was locking every quarter note in with him. 
and transcribed it thick pins comping on many many of those arrangements so and i found that i was overplaying most of the time by by transcribing uh, mr Thigpen. so uh he was probably the the gentlest brush player that i heard and then shelly mann and uh, then papa joe i went to papa joe later because most of the early bassy records i couldn't hear if they were playing brushes and then I had the lesson with philly joe jones and that completely opened up my whole thing after studying with John Von Olin for eight months after I left Indiana University to study with John. And his whole thing was a lateral approach and that's where I picked that up. So I put all this rudimental type playing together with the lateral motion and that's how I kind of came up with, with what I do. And Adam, you said something very interesting about the brush playing getting into the sticks. I also felt that way, especially after seeing Mel Lewis because he had this swirly motion around the drum says he always said if you keep moving you're going to hit something and so you know instead of moving like this up and down on the drums and the cymbals he was moving side to side and i thought that's what i'm doing on the brushes on the snare drum and and my brush playing got into my stick playing and i think for the better for phrasing purposes and 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 um uh the length of the beat like you said and more legato playing overall this, this medium up blues is something that I wrote. And if, if you like it, I wrote it. If, uh, if you don't like it, Steve Smith wrote it. <laughs> and, uh, it's a, uh, uh, an example of playing melody uh, and um, improvising in the middle two choruses. The first chorus I'll play time as if I'm playing uh, with a band and then I'll, I'll solo the next two choruses. And the final chorus will be the melody out again or me playing the, the, the head like it's a melody and ending it. <laughs> say some of your uh, early influences were well interest in and i think adam's going to relate to this mitch mitchell there was a, a hendrix record axis bold as love and the first tune on uh, side one of axis bold as love up up from the skies mitch yeah there you go <laughs> mitch plays some really fantastic brushes and um so, and Ginger Baker played some brushes with Cream and, and also Blind Faith. So I heard, you know, heard those guys play brushes. There were, I don't even know who all the different jazz drummers that I heard. I just heard a lot of jazz drummers play brushes uh, on the records. And, and but, I, but I have to say like a, another, once I got more into it, a great album when you, you asked about albums to listen to is Live at the Pershing uh, by the Ahmed Jamal, Jamal Trio with Vernel Fournier on, on, uh, on drums and, and the way he played brushes. And, and I've seen some videos of, of them. And interestingly, like, if, you know, if I take my typical, you know, Vic Firth heritage brush and I don't always have the, the, the brushes all the way expanded like that. But I noticed when he played, he had this very, very tight, you know, so there's so many different approaches that you can take. And for some reason, 
having just a very thin approach, uh, that worked for him and sounded really amazing in that group. So that album is a classic. I think it was recorded in 1958. The first thing that I'm going to do is, is before I even play to a track, I'm just going to talk about the, my most fundamental brush approach. And, and, and I really got a lot of this from Ed Thigpen. I was fortunate that I get to spend a lot of time with Ed Thigpen. And he showed me and broke down like his basic brush pattern that, that really I've adopted as my most like say go-to fundamental 4-4 four, four steady pattern. So that's the first thing I'm going to do is just describe that. And then I'm going to play uh, a little bit to a blues, one chorus of blues at 90 beats uh, a minute. And then uh, just about one chorus of, of uh, rhythm changes at 120. So this is just laying out some fundamental moves on the brushes. My fundamental brush pattern starts with the right brush on the right side of the head, left brush on the left side of the head, and that's one, beat one. For beat two, I leave the left brush on the head, slide over to where one was, and cross over with the right brush to the left side of the head, and that's two. And then right back to the beginning for three, and then cross over again and slide that left brush for four. So essentially, it's just a two beat phrase one, two, one, two, or one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Nice to have the snares off to get a dark sound, especially. I like to do this maybe at the beginning of a tune and then switch the snares on at a certain point that. Uh, gives the tune an uplift. So, if we try that pattern, essentially it's one, two, three, four. You feel in the pulse, mainly from the right brush, you feel the length of the note with the left brush because that brush stays in contact with the head. One, two, three, four, one. Now we can add the skip beat. A one, two, a three, four, a one, two, a little bit of a D kind of shape. Well, if I look at the whole thing, it's kind of a G. That gives a nice smooth sound. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now I'm lifting up the right brush to cross over, but then keeping it in contact with the head when I slide back. So let's see what that looks like and sounds like if we add one, a little bit of time two, to that. A one, two, two three, three, four. that I'm playing along 
to the tracks that come with the DVD, uh, The Art of Playing with Brushes. It comes with a CD or, or a download. And these are the actual tracks that all the drummers in the DVD played along with. And they all played to the same tempo so we could see how seven different drummers approach for instance, the same song at the same tempo. This is called Bright Medium Swing, 196. And the approach I'm taking with this is a bit um, abstract and not uh, a, a, around playing a repetitive pattern. So I'm breaking up the time a bit. I'm using the brushes, but uh, with the whole kit. So I'm playing phrases that incorporate the brush, or the snare drum, the bass drum, and the hi-hat, and just playing with some rhythms that it's in tempo, it's in time, but it's not just straight down the pipe, kind of straight ahead playing. It's a little freer, it's a little more open and impressionistic, but nevertheless, it, it keeps time. It puts the, the, like the main part of the timekeeping in a way on the bass player and the guitar player and i'm and i'm getting a little more creative with it so it's not really soloing i'm still playing the role of an accompanist but it's a little more abstract you also brought up calfskin heads because you know that that uh, that again has influenced brush technique and some of the techniques that the drummers used before 1957 and then you know when that was before Remo came up or introduced the, the very popular uh, you know mylar drum head I, I recently played a um, I had I was in Australia and I played some brushes on an old snare drum with a calf head. The drum was so messed up it didn't even have a bottom head or snares. But it sounded incredible. Mm -hmm. just the fact that it had this calfskin head. So that's like, because Steve Smith was playing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the drum, it was amazing that it sounded so good. But, you know, in some ways we have to compensate for the fact that we're not playing on that kind of head any, any longer. Yeah. And so it requires even more what you're talking about with the lateral motions, I think, to get a really beautiful tone out of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I played calfskin for 30 years and Remo was getting frustrated that he couldn't get me to play the mylar. And in fact, you know, asked me to be a part of the development of the fiber skin heads. And uh, he asked Billy, uh, Billy Higgins, uh, uh, Louis Belston, uh, Ed Thickpin and I for our input. And we all gave him our input because we all played a lot of calf. And that's what it came up with. Uh, I switched to fiber skin heads because I, I, I was having difficulty playing the up tempos in Ray Brown's trio on a calf skin head. And then with Oscar Peterson, and I thought, I am not going to lose my job and be a purist and play a calfskin head, you know, and be out of work. And that's, that's when I switched to uh, the plastic head, because it does help you bounce a little more at those up tempos. Right. And that's what I play, the diplomat, the fiber skin diplomat. Yeah. That's and, it. Yeah. yeah. Love that head. Adam, I noticed you brought a, five, uh, a calfskin 
had to the yeah the the playing with brushes DVD that you that you and I yeah I brought brought out Lewis's snare drum with the calf head on it. Heaven forbid I put something else on that drum. (laughs) Break me down. (laughs) But a lot of the guys played that head and they loved it. Of course they did because that was what they grew up with. Yeah. And I, I love the sound of calf, and there's the res- a certain resilience also within a calf head that you're not going to find in a plastic head. You know, it, it's got a little bit more give. Like Jeff said, it may not have the same amount of tension and bounce that a plastic head does, but it will have a little bit more mm, than you'll find in a piece of plastic. Plastic has a threshold, and it'll break. You know, the calf will have a little bit more give to it. And... Uh, I used calf for quite a while, but then when I started getting involved in louder situations, you know, it was kind of hard to fight Mike Stern with the calf head, you know? When I first moved to town to Los Angeles, Nick Ciroli, rest his soul, uh, and kindly enough, sent me in on a Ray Anthony big band job. And uh, Marshall Royal was playing lead alto, Bill Watrous. I mean, it's just a great band. And, um, and they're all warming up, you know, on the stage. It was a dance. And, uh, and Ray had a powder blue tuxedo on, I remember, with the crushed velvet light blue tie. And, and, and so everybody's warming up. I just picked up the brushes and played really quietly. And he bangs, I'm up on a riser, and he bangs on the top of the bass drum. And he says, you can put those away. You won't be needing those. And I looked at him and I said, you haven't heard me play them yet. <laughs> and, and he turned around and left me alone. <laughs> Well, it's, well it's, it's, it's that bugs me when they, there's this stereotype about about you know oh you know brushes or or sticks anything you know just well, give me a glad, just give me a chance to mess it up. So during during our lockdown, it, I have been going to our local record store, and one of the albums I bought that I had when I was a kid was James Taylor's first album with Fire and Rain. Mm-hmm. Now that's Russ Kunkel playing with brushes, and those tom fills are incredibly beautiful and they're right up in the mix and they're loud. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he was playing time on the snare, but when it came time for the fills, he just played them with the brushes and they sound amazing. Like check that track out if you haven't heard it for a long time. It's pretty impressive. So I have a question and and Jeff, you weren't there, but you know, a bunch of years back, Steve held up the DVD. We produced uh, Steve, Adam, myself, and my ex-partner Paul produced a um, an instructional video called right. "Playing with Brushes." I would love to hear. Um, I don't know exactly how many years ago it was, but it was a bunch. And and unfortunately, we've lost some of the gentlemen that we were able to uh, film. But Steve or Adam, do you guys have you know one sort of watershed moment of either you know something that you saw, spoke to one of the guys? heard an answer or you know something that mentioned to you at the sessions when we were filming well i take it rob i'll 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 go is that i'll answer first i watched the video the other night for the first time in in many years it was 2007 that we recorded it wow. and uh you know it trans it's a, an amazing education about brushes yes but it, it transcends that. It's, it's really getting inside these guys thinking when it comes to music. It's hearing their commentary on how they play music that's really uh, uh, makes this even more valuable than it is as a brush DVD. Because uh, just to hear Eddie Locke talk about music or, or Billy Hart. Charlie Persip, you know, Joe Morello. Well, I just try to follow what's what's happening with the music is and uh 
just this sort of back and forth sound keeps it kind of full rather than just doing this or so the combination of regular cymbal rhythm Ben Riley, all these guys, they have so, they're so pure and they're so insightful. And, and even though a lot of them are around the same age, funny enough, they, in a way, they come from different eras and they talk about the music very differently. Like Eddie Locke really goes back to like a Papa Joe era. And the way he plays is so deep in the pocket and Ooh. really, really totally grooving and swinging. And then, uh, you know, Joe Morello, they're around the same age, but coming from a completely different place. Also, Charlie Persip, who comes out more like the bebop guy. You know, he's more coming from a bebop place where then Billy Hart is like the modernist. You know, he comes off as being much more uh, of a modern kind of a player. So I was just knocked out by the whole presentation. And, and when we, Adam and I, interviewed these guys, that's when they really got to talk. Yeah, you could really hear clearly like one section to the next, how you changed up the feel. Mm -hmm. And then I, when you played the, 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 the second feel that you got into is when then the left hand I was hearing playing all four beats to Hoping the bar. Hoping you could break <laughs> down and show us what you were doing initially in the slower tempo, uh -huh. and uh, then go ahead and explain what you were doing in the faster tempo. I think I started here, didn't I? Well, you started up with the sock symbol, and then once and you then hit I the, uh, yeah, there we go. This, this beat here. Right. Okay. So the left hand is doing what by itself? So you're sometimes moving. Sometimes I go this way. So you sometimes, sometimes I go this way too. Okay. So sometimes it's clockwise. Sometimes it's counterclockwise. Yeah. I, I got to go back and watch it. I didn't realize it's 13 years ago, but wow. Uh, it, it. I remember just you know couple of days we were in the studio just being blown away by these guys. Ben Riley, you know, yeah. humor. It, you know, it, it, was a, it was a really wonderful session. Adam, you know, Steve, if I can interject, I, you know, I, I, I did see the, the, the DVD. And I, the thing that struck me was that is what I would like to be uh, considered as is those are all musicians who happen to play the drums. Amen. Amen. And, and there, there are so many drummers that are doing show and tell stuff with the brushes and with the drums now that are only drummers and what they're doing doesn't apply to music or they, you look at their their careers and they're not playing with musicians they're just playing drums so you know that's the common thread of all those gentlemen that you just spoke of inspired with you know a lot of energy is going towards people playing with brushes I think the fact that they're home and they need to play and they they want to play but they don't want to play too loud and that's that's great and just if if some of uh, us talking about this inspires people I think that's really wonderful and there's uh, just get some brushes and and get into it start having some fun with them I think uh, a lot of times brush players feel intimidated when they just start playing because they can't do everything that they can do with the sticks. And so they try to do way too much. And if you just approach it as just, I, I suggest players sitting down and just getting a serene sound like the ocean 
with no time in it, just be able to get a, a smooth sound and then gradually put bumps in that, you know, speed bumps in the road. And those will be your accents that will eventually work into time. And a lot of times you come up with your own kind of stroke and your own, your own uh, process of playing. And instead of, you know, I, we see, we see all these, these uh, online shots of people who think they're brush geniuses and they're, you know, it's all up in the air. It's like a, the Joe Morello story. I, fellas, I don't know if you told this on the DVD, but, but, you know, his vision was terrible. And he walked into the local place and sat at the end of the bar there in New Jersey. And this drummer had all this stuff going on up here. But downstairs, it was like, <laughs> you know, and there's nothing happening on the drum. But it was beautiful up here, you know. And the bartender comes over to Joe and he says, Hey, Joe, this guy's really great, huh? And Joe could hardly see him. And he says, well, I don't know, but whatever he's doing doesn't record very well. <laughs> you know, so I think, I think we got we to gotta approach the brushes from playing music. And then every motion that I learned from Philly Joe, which Mel Lewis hated me doing, you don't need to do all that stuff. Keep your hands on the drum, you know. But there was a reason for every motion that Philly Joe showed me where you land gracefully. You come from in the air and land gracefully on the drum head, and you get a different sound that way. And Philly Joe also said, you got to be pretty when you play the brushes, you know. But I think, you know, every motion that he did make had something to do with what was at the end of that motion to, to, to play beautiful music. And the other thing is, don't take yourself so seriously. Be serious about what we're doing and playing. And the brushes are anything. But be serious about being a good musician. But don't take yourself so seriously. We got into this thing because it was fun. And we need to still have fun. I mean, all of us on here are still kids mentally. And we can't wait to get to the drum set and have more fun. But there's so much analyzing going on that I don't think people can let themselves do that. I, I would encourage people to just take a breath and back off of that a little bit and realize, what's the first, what's why, why did I get in this in the first place? Amen, baby. It was because it's fun. Yeah. Let's remember that word, play. P-L-A-Y. It's actually meditative. I'm sorry, Adam. It, yeah, uh, you're right, man. Yeah, getting that sound is actually meditative. And if I if I come home in a funk from something, a session or whatever, and I'd be just madder than hell, I'd just go out to the drum room and sit down and pick up a pair of brushes and play slow ballad quarter notes. And you feel your shoulders drop. You start breathing slower. I mean, it's like, hey, nothing else matters now. I've got the brushes in front of me, you know. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah. Well, listen, guys, thank you. Um, I really thank appreciate you. your time today. It was, it's a pleasure to spend time and, 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 and hear your wisdom and, and pearls of knowledge. <laughs> I mean that really. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for, thanks for putting this together. Thank you. Bye. Really appreciate you being here and, and be safe out there and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk soon. Yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to learn from these two gentlemen too. We're, we're always learning. Our ears are always open and thanks for the opportunity, Rob. It's great to work with you again. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you all. Stay safe. Rob, thank you. Jeff, all the best with the bride. Stay, thank you. Yeah. Stay hello. Yes. Everybody, Bye -bye. thanks to everyone and be careful out there. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank right. you.